Hello, everyone. Welcome to the PhD training in data science. So, uh, the talk today mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, will be about uh, the crystal isometry principle. So, usually I give uh, this talk at uh, research seminars and for conferences, but today it's for PhD students the University of Liverpool and also uh, around the world. So please uh, uh, ask questions. It will be uh, longer than a usual seminar talk for uh, plan for one and a half hour. So please ask questions uh, and stop me at the, any time. So let, me, uh, let me first mention what um, the result that I will be presenting uh, joined with um, many colleagues from the data science group in the material innovation factory at Liverpool. And uh, well, uh, I'm starting with showing informally what types of objects we consider. So briefly, uh, we call solid crystalline materials, or uh, more formally, we will call them periodic crystals or shortly crystals. So the uh, key, uh, the key thing uh, about uh, these periodic crystals, uh, our key approach is to study them at the atomic level. So at the level of atoms, as you see here. So it's a very, um, um, it's a very atomic level. So mask if uh, on the left hand side you recognize uh, you recognize a crystal consisting of uh, some molecules. If you have studied chemistry in school or have seen any visualization uh, software previously, you ice. might read ah, ice. Yes, absolutely correct. So here you see water molecules with one uh, oxygen atom in red, the two small hydrogen atoms, and indeed uh, these water molecules will come form a crystal, which is usually called ice. This particular configuration, I think, is called hexagonal ice. You, you, might, you might see hexagonal cycles here of six molecules. And uh, this is actually the main reason why snowflakes are hexagonal. So this asymmetry from the atomic level it goes up to the <clears throat> microscopic level and, and, and our usual <clears throat> our usual measurements. But also on the right hand side, uh, you see a much more complicated crystal. So not no simple molecules, and it's called metal organic framework, where um, uh, organic chemical elements also uh, joined with metal atoms and they form, uh, you see here, yeah, large cycles at um, nanometer scale. So it's um, about 10 times more than uh, the atomic level, atomic scale. So we study all types of uh, periodic crystals, molecular organic on the left or any inorganic as well. So the only restriction uh, for these objects is periodicity. So the main questions uh, that uh, we would like to uh, answer in a formal mathematical way is actually what is a crystal or more exactly what crystals uh, can be or should be called the same, and if they're not the same, if they're different, then how much they differ? So these are the basic questions what we will be discussing. Now, a more formal mathematical definition. So formally, we start from a linear basis of Euclidean space. The linear basis it consists of n vectors in n dimension, but in uh, all uh, my examples, I consider only two or three dimensions. So linear basis means that um, any vector can be uniquely represented as a linear combination of uh, these basis vectors. If in this linear combinations we consider only integer coefficients, then uh, the basis defines and or generates the lattice, lattice lambda. So it's an infinite, infinite uh, periodic set of points. So for example, starting from the simplest orthonormal basis on the plane, we can generate the unit square lattice consisting of these black dots. Okay, so all linear combinations of these two green vectors generate well, the infinite set of points. Here I show only 16 of them, but uh, the set is infinite. So also the same basis defines the unit cell. So when we have a ba the basis, we could consider um, 
the linear combinations not with integer coefficients but with real coefficients. So imagine uh, with coefficient ci is not is no longer an integer but a real number from zero to one. Then this linear combinations form the parallel pipet in high dimensional space or in uh, the plane it is a parallelogram sometimes a square so that unit square generated by this basis or if you choose a different basis this unit cell might look as this parallelogram or that parallelogram okay any questions on uh, the definition of a lattice in the unit cell we start from a basis we can generate an infinite set of points, which is the lattice, and also a bounded set of points called uh, the unit cell. So this picture uh, hopefully illustrates for you that uh, there is um, the following ambiguity in the definition. You could get exactly the same unit square lattice by starting from a different basis. So not only from uh, this green basis, um, Two vectors, but we could start uh, with the basis gen uh, generating this unit cell. So the unit cell is different, but the underlying lattice obtained from linear combinations of these two vectors is exactly the same, the same square um, lattice. And also we could choose uh, many other different bases or unit cells generating uh, the same square lattice. So there are infinitely many of them. Any questions? Okay, so this was uh, the simplest periodic structure called the lattice. Now to uh, model an arbitrary periodic crystal, we also need um, so called finite motif. So motif of atoms or uh, atoms or molecules or ions or molecules in a unit cell. So uh, here, every point, every atom is represented by a zero size point in the atomic center. So we take a finite set of points in unit cell, and then uh, periodically translate this unit cell in all two or three directions according to the dimension and generate the infinite periodic set. So formally, any point in the infinite periodic set is a sum, a vector, sum of a vector from a lattice and a point from a motif. Or in a slightly different way, we could define the same periodic point set as a finite union of lattices. So we put, for example, the origin of a lattice at that point, this blue point, and also add the lattice and generate it to the origin at that point, at this point, so at all eight points. It's a union of eight lattices. The full uh, infinite periodic point set can be considered as a finite union of several lattices. And uh, the next picture uh, shows what the ambiguity in this definition becomes even more substantial because we could uh, even fix a basis, fix a unit cell, such as this square cell, but choose different motifs inside. For example, with a motif of eight points and another motif. Eight points. So I hope you see that well, they are different. But uh, applying uh, our periodic translations to two uh, different motifs, we uh, end up with essentially the same periodic point sets. Or more exactly, more formally, they differ by translation. In the same periodic point set, you could find a motif of one type and also a motif of another type. So you could we could easily uh, translate these um, representations into each other. So that's why uh, we need to clarify the concept of an equivalence. What, um, what underlying periodic uh, point sets uh, should be called equivalent. And in our PhD training, we have discussed uh, an equivalence relation many times. So the next slide only um, reminds the formal definition. So a binary relation between any types of objects, for example, lattices or periodic crystals, is called an equivalence if the following axioms are satisfied. 
with, uh, with axioms or conditions on binary relation. If the axioms are satisfied, then this relation is called an equivalence relation. And especially the transitivity axiom here is important for uh, any well-defined classification. When we split objects into classes, it's important uh, that <clears throat> they um, end up in disjoint classes. The transitivity axiom says that if two classes overlap, then they should coincide. So that's how we get uh, different classes. Okay, what equivalences could we consider on crystals? So in principle, many different relations are possible. And for example, the simplest possible, the simplest one is uh, by chemical composition. You could say that two crystals are uh, equivalent if we have the same chemical composition. Yes, this is correct. This is a well-defined equivalence, but uh, not uh, always um, sufficient because different materials such as diamond and graphite, they consist of pure carbon, or one chemical element, nothing more, but they have vastly different properties because the uh, geometric crystal structures are different. Uh, another way, uh, we could fix uh, one property, uh, not chemical composition, but a different one, say uh, the physical density. And we could say that uh, two periodic crystals are equivalent if they have the same value of that particular property, such as density. This is also well defined. However, you can easily imagine different crystals uh, also with different physical or chemical properties, but have the same density or almost the same density in indistinguishable values. So the problem here is that if you fix one or several properties, they may not be enough to, um, to guarantee that, uh, that all other properties will be the same. Crystallography studied periodic crystals uh, by using um, relation based on symmetries or space group types. And the classification of these uh, symmetry groups in dimension three was finished already at the end of the 19th century. And for that period, it was a great achievement. 230 classes, but these classes uh, are discrete. So it means we have 230 so finitely many classes. However, many different uh, crystals, so even the uh, table state, so this rock salt crystal and uh, many others, they, they have the same uh, space group type, but still uh, different compositions and uh, different properties. So that's why it makes sense uh, to ask the question, what is the strongest relation that we could uh, define uh, on periodic crystals? So uh, one particular attempt uh, by the crystallography community, so which, which is uh, still visible right now in the IUCR, the International Union of Crystallography Online Dictionary. So we have, have a concept of hyperstructural crystals, which seems relevant. So crystals are said to be hyperstructural if they have the same structure. And well, these examples are given. So the word structure, uh, as you see here, is repeated twice. So as a structure uh, defined in terms of a structure. And uh, whereas IUCR online dictionary has uh, another um, definition, not of a structure, but of a crystal structure, quickly referring to uh, another um, concept of a crystal pattern, which is actually defined exactly in the same way as uh, on my uh, formal slide with the definition of periodic points. So simply as a, as a basis of a unit cell and then a motif, and then you get uh, the periodic points. But uh, not specifying an equivalence relation. So what was uh, previously missing is uh, an equivalence relation that would be strongest in practice. So crystallographers tried for a long time to define um, a canonical representation for crystal, also called conventional. And uh, indeed, uh, were uh, long books and many volumes of international papers of crystal, they, uh, they discuss how to do it for different types of crystals. Yes, this is all correct. So, but unfortunately, uh, the real data is growing. So we are getting more and more real crystals 
and all this data is noisy in the sense that uh, atomic coordinates are easily perturbed. So, so this perturbation, this noise comes from experimental measurements, but also if you um, determine a crystal structure from, uh, say, diffraction pattern, the same material, but the different temperatures or pressures, then you will get slightly different atomic coordinates. And then these atomic coordinates are perturbed, you get a situation uh, like that. So it is illustrated here on a very simple case when we perturb every second point in the unit square lattice, but uh, with uh, perturbation can be applied to or can appear in, in any real crystal, not only in, in that square lattice. So what happens here is initially our unit square well was minimal. So it had only one point in the center, but under any small perturbation, if we shift every second uh, atom slightly, our uh, oh, equation, ah, moist, sorry, I did not notice that uh, you also joined. So I, I was a bit late, but uh... Uh, yeah, I was thinking point. about your definition of the isostructural. You, you mean isoconfigurational? Because isostructural is... Uh, I uh, mean, uh -huh. considering the structures, normally they go from first isopointal and then they go to isoconfigurational. So your isostructural... Uh, what is, I mean, your, the definition that we're using, where it is... It is, so you could you could Google it right now. It is in the UCR online dictionary. So that's the exact quote from... from yeah, yeah, but I mean, uh, I don't know who has written this uh, because... And there are certain definitions which are kept for, let's say, for... It's another question that this could, definition of Pfizer configuration is not very, very useful. This is another question because they say simply there that... Uh, so I'd say the occupied orbit should be similar, and this similar means nothing. I mean, agree. Uh, but yes. uh, I was wondering that you don't didn't mention that explicitly, and you use this isostructural, which I don't know what does it mean. I, I also don't know, so that's why that's why I, I give this quote because uh, this definition is requires requires defining the concept of a structure first. Because it uses the concept of a structure and to, to define but I mean, normally structure structure type, normally structure type is related to isoconfigurational. And okay. that's why I'm a bit lost here in all this. Because yeah. uh, it is even it is a definition as we have given it here. I mean this same structure, I don't know what does it mean. <laughs> me too, absolutely agree. So me too, I also don't understand uh, what it means. Uh, so I'm not sure who exactly uh, wrote this definition, but we are discussing how to make it better. Well, not, not this particular concept as a structure, but how to define an equivalence relation in a non-ambiguous way. Yeah, yeah, this, I understand this point. I mean, this is in fact the main question, so. Yes. Okay, right. thank you, thank you very much. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. Oh, fine, fine, thank you, Moise. Okay, um, so so let me continue with this uh, discontinuity of conventional cells. Mm -hmm. So under small perturbation, a unit cell can become uh, larger, say twice larger, but if it uh, keep perturbing our points, we could make it, for example, three times larger, four times larger, so any scaling here is possible. And instead of what uh, simple square lattice, you could take actually your favorite crystal, um, minimal uh, primitive unit cell, double it in, let's say, one direction, and then perturb only one atom, say, in second copy. And in the same way, as illustrated here, the resulting doubled cell will become um, primitive, so minimal by volume, so it will also double in size. So the problem here is uh, that even the volume of that unit cell or the size of a motif changes discontinuously. And, uh, and that's why, uh, yeah, it would be nice to have, um, to have a better understanding when, um, 
when these two nearly identical crystals, so where, what uh, differ only by a small atomic displacements, when we can recognize when it's near the right. uh, <clears throat> So one more uh, attempt uh, to um, to understand whether uh, these two close crystals are indeed close was to use, uh, say, a threshold for perturbations. So we could try to say that two periodic structures, two periodic point sets, are pseudo-symmetric, or one is has a um, is, yeah, uh, has a, almost a symmetry of a square lattice. If uh, if it perturb some up uh, atoms up to small threshold, say epsilon, and then um, uh, and then it's fine. So up to up to small perturbation. So unfortunately, if you continue with perturbations, so if you uh, allow any um, any chain of very small perturbations, then uh, we could um, deform through this long chain, uh, sufficiently long chain of perturbations, we could deform essentially any periodic set of points to any other periodic set of points, which is illustrated here in the simple example of lattices. When we consider only lattices and slightly perturbed uh, basis vectors, so changing, for example, one coordinate, say the x coordinate of the vector v2, we could, if we allow uh, um, ourselves to change it slightly by any small threshold epsilon, when continuing shifting uh, with vector, we could get this lattice and then that lattice so continuously. And uh, this final lattice that actually coincides with the initial one. Hopefully, you recognize uh, this is the same unit square lattice of black dots. So, this um, long chain of perturbations essentially represents a continuous loop in the space of lattices. So, that's why uh, it would be nice to have a continuous approach to see and uh, to see that space not only discreetly but continuous. So back back to the uh, the question, what is the strongest relation? So this paper with a very nice title, same or different part of the question, uh, tried to uh, uh, answer or even pose and answer this question exactly for crystals. And the question the question turned out to be non-trivial and was discussed uh, also uh, around this time. So this is a screenshot from 2021 from the newsletter of uh, the uh, UCR International Union of Crystallography, where uh, potential changes to the definition of a crystal uh, were discussed. So in our opinion, what was uh, really missed is um, a formal definition of an equivalence that uh, is strongest in practice. And we argue that since crystal structures are determined in rigid form, then the strongest equivalence relation between them in practice is a rigid motion. Rigid motion is defined as a composition of translations and rotations in a Euclidean space, illustrated here uh, on that simple graph for a molecule. There is uh, a slightly weaker relation when we also allow mirror reflections. And in mathematics, it's called isometry or sometimes congruence. Isometry is any composition of translation, rotations, and also reflections. And uh, another definition of isometry is any map or transformation that preserves distances. So it's an equivalent definition in the Euclidean space. We, we will often use in uh, this uh, session the word isometry, although yeah, there, is, there is a slight difference between isometry and rigid motion. Why is this difference a small? Because uh, any um, isometry can be obtained as a composition of a single mirror reflection and a suitable rigid motion. So when we consider periodic crystals up to isometry, it means that we only do not distinguish mirror images. But to distinguish mirror images, we need only uh, one uh, extra bit of information. So some sort of sign of orientation that can distinguish them. That's why the classification up to isometry or up to the strong relation rigid motion were different, but they are very close. 
So uh, what I uh, would like to propose is the following. So previously, uh, crystallographic information file. So this is the main um, data representation of uh, real crystals. So it contains the information about the unit cell, uh, about the motif of atoms. So essentially defining uh, well, crystal, uh, crystal structure or crystal pattern as uh, as uh, written in the ICR online dictionary. But uh, this uh, crystallographic information file, this uh, cell with a motif, they uh, essentially um, give us or represent only a single snapshot of a periodic crystal or per periodic structure. They give us a single photograph. And uh, conventional uh, representations might be considered as or very say, standardized um, standardized uh, representations such as the passport photo. So yes, uh, of course, any, any, any person or any object would have well, a standardized photo as in the passport or uh, many other photos, but the underlying structure can be or even should be considered as, uh, as a class of all, of all uh, crystals equivalent to each other under the strongest relation rich motion or only slightly weaker under isometry. So mathematicians would consider uh, periodic structure um, as, um, as a class of all equivalent representations of periodic crystals. So equivalent under rigid motion. So for example, when we, even for a fixed unit cell, when we shift uh, our motif uh, inside a fixed unit cell, when crystallographic information file changes, but uh, this shift uh, essentially keeps the same structure only because well, uh, all atoms uh, have now shifted coordinates. Any questions at this point? I'm sorry about this, uh, uh, let's say, but let me understand better what you mean by that. So. I mean, we know that we have our Euclidean group and it includes all isometries. So yes. does it mean that uh, we have to act only with isometry on the crystal structure in order to have these, they belong to the same rigid class of crystals? Okay, so, so rigid motion and isometry is a little bit different, so they differ by orientation. But uh, if you can see the, yeah, the full Euclidean group, uh, as you suggest, when uh, we get isometry classes of crystals. Isometry so classes. That, that you take your structure, you act with all elements of the Euclidean group, and you say, this gives me my class of equivalent structures. Yeah, absolutely correct. So by well, isometry I mean, class... what will happen if the space group is changed? Because uh, we know that, let's say, to the Euclidean group elements that could correspond some which doesn't belong to the normalizer of the space group that means you put together crystal structures whose space groups are different yes if uh, <clears throat> if we change uh well roughly speaking the rigid shape of a crystal structure for example we perturb one atom symmetry group changes right then we get a, a different uh, rigid or isometry class. A different one. As, uh, as in this example, let me, uh, so for example, comparing these two uh, very close geometrically, so these uh, periodic structures, periodic points are very close geometrically, but uh, they, they are different. So they are not rigidly equivalent, but also not isometric. Because we cannot match them exactly by rigid motion or by isometry. So different symmetries, different isometry classes. Yeah, but I mean, you didn't answer explicitly my question. So my question is, to your class of, uh, let's say, of rigid structures, or how I call them, rigid class of crystals, will belong also structures whose symmetry group is different. Is it correct? 
No, the symmetry group uh, is invariant and any isometry it is preserved. So no, it's not, no, 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 no. I mean, my space group, the normalizer of the space group in the Euclidean group is fixed and it's a, it's a subgroup of the Euclidean group. That means there are elements which will, let's say, change the space group. If you consider your rigid motion or even, let's say, or isometries, if you like, but... Uh, so that 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 that's why I'm I'm a bit uh, so to say uh, lost uh, in these definitions. So to understand better what is a right class of crystals or rigid class of crystals, I mean for me uh, could be only crystals whose space group symmetry is the same, and to say no no, I don't care about space group symmetry. What I'm interested in is just the application of my isometry. Moise, I think you are talking about a different equivalence relation. So in terms of an algebraic invariant, such as a space group or um, yeah, space group related, so in terms of that uh, algebraic invariant, we are talking purely in terms of uh, geometric transformation. But I mean, mm -hmm. just so if, if it's would possible. you like to define your invariant formally? No, no, I mean, that's uh, for me, a space group is something, let's say, in this classification, I mean, it's something sacred. And uh, that's why I would reduce the number of isometries only to those that belong to the normalizer of the space group. Otherwise, I mean, in the Euclidean, of course, group. The normalizer of the space group in the Euclidean group. But otherwise, I mean, I'm lost because uh, in your rigid class of crystals, if I understand mm -hmm. again, I mean, it could be that I misunderstood some point. There will be long crystals whose, uh, let's say, space group symmetry is different and this i don't understand i mean there could be as you say some pseudo symmetry but there the question we enter in very let's say quite uh, tricky problem of what is the tolerance because uh, one cannot define the kind of sacred number mm -hmm. <laughs> which is valid for all structures you have to have it very very specifically etc etc so this is just the definition. I'm sorry. Sorry to. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Moise, would you like to give an example? So, could you, could you, uh, well, may, maybe not immediately now, but later, if you uh, send me an example of uh, a pair of crystals that you would like to ask, well, test whether they are uh, equivalent under rigid motion or isometry, yeah, would you like to consider a specific example? No, but I mean, you understand the point. The point is that the isometry. So to say, is an element of the Euclidean group. Yes. And at the same time, the normalizer of a space group is a subgroup of the Euclidean. So there could be, one can define it with respect to different groups, but if you define your normalizer with respect to the Euclidean group, it is a subgroup. And that's why if it is a subgroup, that means that there will be operations or isometries elements of the Euclidean group, which will not leave, let's say, that doesn't belong to the normalizer. And uh, if that doesn't belong to the normalizer, the space group, that you'll change your space group. And that's why I don't understand. I mean, that uh, to the same crystal, rigid class of crystals, I could have... Uh, would you give an example? Could you prepare an example that uh, we can discuss in detail? Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. Yes, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, any more questions? Right. <clears throat> then, how could we distinguish uh, crystals uh, up to rigid motion or uh, isometry? So, or generally under, uh, under any equivalence relation? So, to do this, uh, in mathematics, we use invariance. So an invariant is the property that is preserved under given equivalence relation. 
For example, if our main Killens relation is isometry, when we talk about isometry invariance. So formally, uh, it is uh, since it is a property preserved under isometry, it is well defined not only on uh, our initial objects, but on classes of on isometry classes of crystals. Because uh, any two crystals, any two periodic structures, any two periodic point sets within one class should have the same value of this invariant. So uh, in uh, a little bit more formally, if two periodic point sets are isometric, then the invariant should take the same value. That's why the single value would be considered for the whole class, for the whole isometric class of crystals. And uh, of course, these values uh, should be in some simple space. So to, um, to, uh, to benefit from this invariant, uh, um, we need a space where comparison uh, of values is easy. For example, it would be nice to get some numbers, vectors, or uh, even slightly more complicated objects, but still easier to compare than the original crystals. So why, uh, why is uh, this concept of invariant important? It's important because uh, it allows us to distinguish non-equivalent, non-isometric crystals. If an invariant takes different values on, on, some, crystal, on some periodic point sets, then by definition of this invariant, the crystal should not be isometric. So why? Because if I isometric, well, the value should be the same. But we know the value is different. The values are different. That's why this underlying crystal should be different. So it will be 100% sensitive. If you have a non-invariant, we cannot make this conclusion at all. For example, we could list atomic coordinates um, in a given cell basis, or even order them in any way. But comparing these atomic coordinates between various crystals does not help us uh, to make a conclusion to distinguish crystals. Because uh, under uh, isometry or rigid motion, we can easily shift all our atoms by the same vector even within the fixed unit cell. So all these atomic coordinates change, but uh, under rigid motion, it's um, the same object. It's the same equivalence class. So that's why it's important to distinguish between non-invariant descriptors and invariants. But sometimes can distinguish some crystals, some objects, but possibly not all of them. So for example, uh, so previously we have seen um, different, chemically different crystals that have the same space group 225. The space group is an isometric invariant, but it's uh, it doesn't distinguish everything, so it distinguishes some of them. So similarly, physical density is a nice isometry invariant, so even continuous on perturbations, but um, not complete. So we will, uh, what does it mean complete? Uh, yeah, we'll formally define it, I think, yeah, on, um, let me actually skip this, um, skip this comparison with equivariance, which is more mathematical, and uh, discuss, um, and discuss, uh, yeah, and, and discuss um, continuity and completeness. So further properties that uh, we would like uh, to have for our invariants is continuity. Why continuity? Because uh, atomic coordinates are not restricted to discrete values. So they are not on a say, pixel grid, as say for images, they have continuous real values and uh, especially uh, if we increase uh, temperature, they, they will vibrate more than um, the absolute zero temperature. So that's why we are always um, changing. And small perturbations produce slightly different crystal, not rigidly equivalent to the original structure. So sometimes it's uh, chemists or uh, even uh, our colleagues in the materials innovation factory. So this is a particular comparison when uh, we would like to say that these two um, snapshots of one crystal here is real, so with uh, curved, curved arms and one is uh, simulated, so with straight, straight arms, we would like to call them 
close, similar or close, yeah, that's okay. But uh, rigidly, as you see, you lie different, so there is no complete match between them. So that's why we would like uh, to understand uh, not only uh, whether two crystals are different, but also how much they differ. Informally, to continuously quantify a difference between them. So previously, uh, these comparisons uh, were uh, over often restricted to a, a fixed space group. So when we compare, for example, crystals um, of, uh, that have the same symmetry, say in the simplest case, you would have cubic crystals, as uh, you have previously uh, seen. So cubic crystals, uh, while they, uh, they essentially genetic structure is um, defined by a single parameter, say the uh, smallest interatomic distance between these crystals. And we find a simple space of cubic crystals, yet we could compare them by, um, by taking, say, a difference of these uh, smallest interatomic distances. However, uh, under small perturbation, a cubic crystal becomes non-cubic, and uh, we are going now into a wider space, continuous space, where, um, where the symmetry group is simply generic. So we still uh, consider only periodic crystals, but the generic triclinic space group has only translational periodicity for the P1 group. And uh, if you try to uh, still consider uh, space groups uh, for, for this continuous space, then they define uh, subsets or subspaces, or more exactly, low dimension subspaces. For example, the smallest subspace would be a um, space consisting of only cubic crystals. And uh, this uh, subdivision to discrete classes is um, informally um, similar to splitting a continuous space into disjoint, disjoint uh, pieces. For example, if you have a continuous surface of our planet, well, even now it is split into around 200 countries. But uh, often uh, boundaries between uh, these pieces are rather artificial. And we can, we can do, uh, in science at least, a much better job comparing our objects in a continuous way. So without restricting our attention to discrete classes, we can do it in a more continuous way. So to, to do it uh, formally, in mathematics, we use the concept of a metric which is a property not for a single object, but it's a distance, functional distance a property for two objects, so a pair, a pair of objects. Uh, in this particular case, I have written it in terms of pair of invariants, invariant points. So we have one invariant i and substitute into this invariant two, two different uh, crystals. So this metric should satisfy the following three metric axioms. Uh, the first coincidence axiom says that the distance is zero only if uh, our objects are the same. So uh, more formally, I should actually I should have written here that i of s equals i of q, but uh, informally I assume that um, i is now uh, our complete invariant, so s and q are isometric. So symmetry is when we simply swap our objects and triangle inequality it's hopefully familiar from school geometry. So when we have three, three objects, uh, when the sum of two shorter sides should not be shorter than the longer side. So why, uh, why are these axioms important? So this axiom is important because if we are not satisfied, then uh, almost any conclusion can be made. For example, uh, this uh, recent paper proved so formally proved that if the triangle inequality fails with any small positive error, so when we don't have this inequality, but the opposite one with any small error, then the results of uh, two uh, widely used clustering algorithms can be simply predetermined. So you could design your uh, favorite clusters in advance and then find a suitable similarity distance is not satisfying the triangle inequality that produces these predetermined clusters. And one more condition, uh, which is not uh, in this uh, metric axioms, is mm, well, is continuity, which will be formally stated on the next slide. But uh, here, let me illustrate the difference. So, these metric axioms um, are essential, but not enough, 
because we can easily uh, produce a discontinuous matrix. If, for example, we already know how to distinguish uh, our objects under the given equivalence, for example, crystals on diazometry, then, then we could easily define a so-called discrete distance, saying that the distance is zero on equivalent objects and the distance has a, another value, for example, one on any non-equivalent objects. So this simple distance of two values, zero and one, satisfies all metric axioms, as you can see by definition. However, uh, it is not practically helpful because we uh, call all uh, slightly different, all near duplicate structures, uh, objects differ. Well, the distance is exactly one between all of them. So we cannot say which objects are close, which are more distant. So that's why we need, um, <clears throat> we need other conditions. And that slide uh, summarizes uh, uh, all challenges that we would like to resolve. So the first, uh, the first row in this uh, big image um, illustrates that it's very hard to, uh, to forget about periodicity. So in what sense? If you have um, a periodic set, so here you have a hexagonal lattice in the background, then, well, of course, it's very difficult to work with an infinite object. So it's very tempting to consider a finite subset up to, say, a certain cutoff, cutoff radius for a ball, or uh, a, a square or a box, a rectangular box of a fixed size. So by moving uh, this um, ball of a fixed radius or box of a fixed size, we can easily extract finite subsets that are not asymmetric. They have even different numbers of points inside. So if you forget about the, uh, everything else and uh, look only at a finite subset, then uh, we simply lose our periodic structure completely. So from the same periodic structure, uh, a simple hexagonal axis, we could easily get very different finite subsets. If we, uh, if we don't forget about periodicity, if you remember about um, our unit cell on the basis, then there is ambiguity of uh, choosing a basis and rotations that can change uh, a unit cell. But more importantly, much more importantly, is uh, with discontinuity problem. So when we slightly shift uh, um, one atom in, say, a non-primitive cell, so again, the same hexagonal lattice, primitive cell is small, non-primitive is twice larger. But if you slightly shift, say, the central atom in all these non-primitive cells, then this non-primitive cell becomes primitive, so minimal uh, by volume. And similarly, we could uh, continue with perturbation to slightly shift other points and get a larger primitive cell or even larger and so on. So what does it mean? It means that starting from any periodic crystal, we could consider it uh, in the subspace of crystals that have the same, for example, the same number of atoms in the fixed cell, say uh, M atoms, but also the same periodic structure is infinitely close to a larger subspace. Periodic crystals with twice larger number of atoms, 2m atoms in a primitive cell. Yes, Moise, your question? You are muted. <laughs> Would you like to ask a question? I think you are muted, uh, so that's why we <clears throat> cannot hear you. But you could also uh, try. No, no, I mean, my question was whether mm -hmm. these search, let's say, for bigger cells mm -hmm. couldn't be exhausted or studied systematically using the subgroups of your space group, because what you are doing, in fact, is you consider a bigger cell. That means kind of classing like a subgroups, and then you move your atoms. But I mean, this movement of the atoms, of course, it is, so to say, restricted in a way using the symmetry. So maybe using the classing like a subgroups, one should be able to, to exhaust all possible. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. All <clears throat> so under smooth perturbation, we can quickly go from any um, high symmetry group to uh, the lowest symmetry group uh, for, yeah, for, uh, for triclinic lattice of so P1 symmetry group, right? The lowest, lowest symmetry group when we have only translational symmetry, nothing more. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Right, and even uh, even in this uh, uh, under this translational symmetry only, we still could go to um, any periodic crystal is still infinitely close to uh, with many many subspaces of growing complexity. So having um, the same number of atoms in a fixed cell, or twice number of atoms, or three three times number of atoms, and so on. So, in, so from that point of view, uh, our space um, of rigid classes or isometric classes is, is very complicated because uh, every periodic structure is, uh, is highly simple. Highly simple. Every, every point in our space is, uh, is simple from this point of view. So infinitely many layers with continuous space of periodic crystals. And of course, we could can, uh, restrict our attention to studying, say, crystals only up to a fixed number of atoms in a fixed cell. And then it uh, becomes a little bit easier. But nonetheless, uh, you see there is this ambiguity when our unit cell uh, can arbitrarily scale up in size. Any questions? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's uh, let now formally state uh, the conditions that um, we would like to satisfy. Okay. So the problem. <clears throat> so briefly speaking, we would like to find uh, an easy, continuous, and complete isometry invariant for uh, any discrete sets of unlabeled or unordered points. Today we talked uh, about the periodic sets of points. The previous session was about finite sets of points. So this problem actually covers both cases, but we will continue talking about um, periodic sets for today. So this problem, uh, these conditions well, uh, were already presented previously, so I only summarize. Invariance, so it's important to distinguish objects. Completeness is much harder. So completeness is uh, the opposite uh, condition. So saying that if our invariant takes the same value, when the underlying object should be equivalent. So if an isometry invariant, uh, an isometry invariant is complete, if the same value actually logically implies that the underlying crystals are isometric. Continuity means that we would like to uh, define a metric and a constant such that uh, after perturbing any point of our periodic set, up to epsilon, say in the Euclidean distance, the invariant changes up to that constant times epsilon, so only a little bit with respect to the initial perturbation. This is called Lipschitz continuity, much stronger than the classical epsilon delta continuity. Further conditions. Uh, the reconstruction condition basically says that the invariant should not be too complicated. Uh, more exactly, uh, we could reconstruct our initial periodic point set from its invariant point. So more exactly, of course, we reconstructed um, up to isometry, some isometric image of our periodic point set from a given invariant. So all these conditions uh, become practical when uh, we require that computations are fast enough, and we formally define it uh, by saying that the invariant the metric and the reconstruction from the invariant should be realizable in uh, polynomial time uh, of the motive size, so the number of atoms in the units. So that's why, of course, we exclude an, an, any infinite size invariants. And if all these conditions are really satisfied, so if they all hold, then uh, this invariant can be considered universal for all types of periodic crystals. So we do not uh, require any extra restrictions by symmetry, uh, for example. And if the invariant is simple enough, 
for example, it's a collection of numbers. Then uh, these numbers could be considered uh, analogs of geographic style coordinates on uh, the space of periodic crystals, on the space of the Cleveland clouds. The crystal isometry space or even stronger on the space of region. Any questions on the problem? Okay, so uh, half, uh, half an hour more to now discuss specific invariants that satisfy some of these conditions, uh, almost all of them, but not yet, uh, not yet exactly all of them. So <clears throat> first construction, first invariant, which is simple enough, uh, which is the uh, average minimum distance. Here you see three examples, square lattice, hexagonal lattice, and tectonic comp periodic structure, um, modeling, for example, graphene or similar two-dimensional materials. For any lattice, our motif, our unit cell contains a single point, which could be, for example, shifted to the origin for simplicity. So for that point of origin, we look at neighbors. In the square lattice, we can see first four nearest neighbors at distance one, right? Then uh, four more distant neighbors at uh, distance root two, and so on. So we simply write down these distances to neighbors in increasing order. So put them on, on this graph. <coughs> with distance value on the vertical axis and the index of a neighbor k on the horizontal axis. For the hexagonal lattice, our distances to neighbors uh, they also non-decreasing, so increasing, uh, not strictly in a different way due to this hexagonal symmetry. So that's why you see six repeated values. If you have several points in our unit cell in a motif, then one simple way to get an invariant is uh, to take the average over, um, over points in, uh, in the unit cell. So uh, as a result, we get uh, an infinite sequence of values depending on k. You have an average distance to the first nearest neighbor, AMD1, average distance to the second nearest neighbor, AMD2, and so on. So formally, it's an infinite sequence, although in practice, of course, we compute it up to a certain number of neighbors. Okay, so this, this is already a strong invariant because it uh, contains infinitely many values. However, uh, because of this averaging, you might think that we have uh, lost some information. And the deal there is a way not to lose in this information, but keep it in the form of, um, of a strong invariant. So this invariant was explained in the previous session in the finite case. And this um, uh, slide uh, reminds actually the definition in the finite case of the periodic case is uh, very similar. So let, let me briefly, briefly remind you that in the final case or in the periodic case, we uh, take a point, in the periodic case it will be any point in the unit cell in the motif, and then we write down distances to neighbors in increasing order. First neighbor, second neighbor, and so on. So these distances are non-decreasing, non-strictly increasing, and for this uh, top left vertex on the trapezium, they are increasing in this way. For the top right vertex, uh, in that example, distances to neighbors due to symmetry will be exactly the same, so up to up to three neighbors. <clears throat> so that's why uh, in, in this matrix of uh, distances of distance list will be two identical rows, which are convenient to collapse to a single row, simply to avoid repetition. And when we do this collapsing, uh, we assign the weight. So the number of rows we collapsed uh, over the total number of rows. This number one half, this number one half means that uh, two of four points will claim uh, our say, motif or unit cell. They have the same distances to neighbors. The bottom points have different distances to neighbors. So we have uh, another row also with weight one half. And uh, the kite example uh, has uh, three rows. Is, is, this, uh, is this example clear enough? 
So that's the final phase. And this particular example is interesting because uh, these two quadrilaterals uh, have the same six pairwise distances. Yes, Moise, your question? No, I mean, I was wondering whether the number of rows is in fact not equal to the number of atoms in the asymmetric unit because uh, obviously atoms that belong to the same orbit will have the same set of distances. Yes, you're absolutely right. So for real crystals, of course, uh, we actually use only asymmetric unit and uh, um, like of positions to understand uh, how to correctly compute the weights, but you're absolutely right. The maximum number of rows for a periodic crystal will be the size of an asymmetric unit. Yes. So I think the next slide, yeah, the next slide illustrates uh, this uh, periodic case. So in the square lattice, uh, in our unit cell contains a single point, and that's why the uh, pointless distance distribution, say up to four neighbors, uh, consists of a single row. Uh, in uh, uh, under small perturbation, that square lattice might uh, get uh, a larger cell, so four times larger in this particular example. And since I symmetrically perturbed the points here, so I, I, I shifted up by 0 0.1 this point and uh, pushed down this point also by 0 0.1, then this um, larger unit cell, so it has a uh, Asymmetric unit consisting of two points. So these two points, so the blue and red edges lay exactly form an asymmetric union of two, um, of four points. So on the two of them, that's why the pointless distance distribution for this uh, perturbation uh, will consist of two rows. So one row comes uh, from this um, blue, blue edges where uh, distances changed slightly. So for example, the shortest distance is now 0 0.8, the longest is 1.2. But uh, what is important, they changed only slightly. So more exactly, they changed up to two epsilon. So if you shift uh, any point up to epsilon, then the distance between them changes up to two epsilon. So that's why the corresponding distances uh, between uh, corresponding distances um, in these two matrices, uh, they differ up to two epsilon. And for the red edges where differences are even smaller. So that's why there is a way to continuously compare these matrices even uh, having different numbers of rows and get a well-defined metric uh, which has an upper bound of two epsilon. So this metric which we use here is called earth movers distance. Although there are actually many other metrics uh, on which we could consider on PDD matrices, interpreting them as a discrete probability distributions. So EMD is probably the simplest. So roughly speaking, uh, EMD, uh, so this concept, uh, this metric came from transportation theory. And what do we transport here? We uh, transform one row of the first matrix into two rows of the second matrix. So roughly speaking, we find uh, the best splitting of the first matrix and the best splitting of rows of the second matrix to, to match them as close as possible. So in this simple example, it's actually easy to guess uh, how, uh, how the splitting can be realized. Uh, Mois, uh, would you like to ask a question? Yes, no, this was just related to my previous question because mm -hmm. uh, uh, in fact what you get is a kind of subgroup because under certain perturbation <laughs> I could imagine that you get something which is a subgroup let's say characterized by a subgroup of the initial group and then because of that subgroup you have the splitting etc so I just wanted to, to clear up this whether this concept of subgroups could be useful in this in this case Yes, uh, under small perturbation, we, um, under almost any perturbation, um, so this is actually a, not a generic perturbation because our um, perturbed periodic points still has some symmetry, right? <clears throat> but if we uh, do a genuine generic perturbation, then the resulting uh, symmetry group uh, will be simply uh, P1. 
So only translations will be preserved. So of course, with uh, lowest symmetry group will be a subgroup of the original high symmetry group. Yes, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, any uh, questions on what illustration? Because maybe uh, do they need to be the same length? Good question, Olga. So Olga has asked whether um, we should uh, compare PDD matrices having the same number of columns. So, uh, numbers of rows, uh, they see, can be different, but you're right, but uh, the number of columns should be the same. Should be the same, so that's why what we see here the same case. So we compare, we, uh, roughly speaking, compare our priority point sets up to uh, the same number of neighbors. Locally. So why is it important? Because when we are looking for this optimal um, split and transformation on one PDD matrix into another, then we will need to compare rows. So one row with another row. And so in principle, it can't be done. Yeah, the rows of different sizes, but the simpler approach, uh, the more uh, say justifiable approach is to compare vectors of the same length. Many distances could be used. We used uh, not even the Euclidean distance, as you might have realized, we used the simpler L infinity distance here to compare the rows. So it, um, L infinity here measures the maximum deviation of corresponding coordinates. So in that case, it's 0 0.2 for this uh, two rows and zero, even smaller between that row and the second red row. Okay, but the number of columns, yes. Um, um, should be the same. Okay, <clears throat> so theoretical results about PDD. So first of all, um, let me clarify the depends, dependence on K. So usually when uh, an output depends on some parameters, uh, they uh, seriously affect, affect uh, uh, the result. But in our case, uh, not really, because when we increase the number of neighbors, it means what we add uh, more distances to the PDD matrix, so it becomes longer, but all previous distances remain exactly the same. So increasing K only gives us more information uh, about the local environment of the crystal without changing the previous, the previously uh, known information. So that's why we can see the K not even as a parameter here, but as a degree of approximation, uh, as say the number of uh, decimal places on your calculator. Well, uh, the strongest result about PDD is a generic completeness in the following sense. So if our periodic point set is generic, uh, generic means what, so roughly speaking, uh, all interpoint distances are distinct if you forget about periodicity. Of course, uh, due to periodicity, many interpoint distances are repeated, but only due to this uh, translational periodicity. If, for example, square lattice would not be generic because you have two equal distances, say, in the horizontal and vertical direction. Right. Uh, but if there are no repetitions apart from periodicity, then for such a generic crystal, periodic point set, we can reconstruct it from uh, a lattice of flat, um, a flat periodic set and a large enough PDD matrix. So large enough means a lot, um, it contains uh, large enough distances up to a double cover and radius of uh, our, our periodic points of S. So double cover and radius means uh, the smallest radius, but um, uh, what is enough for both center at our, at our points to cover the whole Indian space. Right. Uh, so here we explicitly use uh, a lattice for reconstruction, although uh, in the case of the lattice, we uh, also consider a similar classification problem on diazometry and rigid motion, and these complete invariants are known in low dimensions on phase. That's why this result is practical in low dimension. But in high dimensions, even for lattices, yeah, the problem uh, uh, of defining complete and continuous invariance is still a challenge. Okay, 
And uh, the second pairing here is about the speed. So the speed of computation where matrix PDD is computable in uh, near -linear, linear time in both key parameters. Parameters here are K for number of neighbors and M for number of points in a module for a fixed dimension. So this complexity result uh, hides some constants depending exponentially on the dimension, but in low dimensional cases two and three, the algorithm is fast. Okay, so since it is fast, of course, we applied it to uh, the large data sets and Cambridge structural database is the world's largest for real materials. At, uh, at this time, when we did it about two years ago now, um, it contained uh, two thirds of a million of pure periodic crystals. So the loud so called disorder and with enough genetic data. So for this number of crystals, you could quickly estimate but there are hundreds of billions pairwise comparisons needed to check whether two crystals are uh, isometric or not. And at this point, we uh, didn't know what to expect. We were simply testing the strength of our invariance of PDD. And to our surprise, we have found uh, several pairs when uh, the distance EMD was exactly zero in our computations. So initially we thought that uh, the invariants were not strong enough. So we actually proved completeness a little bit uh, later after this experiment. But when we looked at this um, particular pair, some pairs, we found that um, in five cases, uh, the distance was zero simply because the sieve files were numerically identical. So they were, uh, they looked a little bit different. Uh, so these are attacked files and uh, atoms were arranged in different rows, uh, but the essential numerical information, such as unit cell parameters and fraction coordinates, were all identical almost to the last decimal place, but uh, one atom was replaced with a different one. So these uh, examples were in different entries of the CSD, and one, uh, well, the most striking example here is hip cup versus Jeplia. Uh, so these are reference codes of the database where everything numerically was identical, but cadmium was replaced with manganese. And those of you who still remember some chemistry from school uh, might realize that these atoms are rather different. Uh, cadmium actually is rather toxic. So chemists told me, but more importantly, probably uh, cadmium and manganese have atomic masses 48 and 25. So they, they have very different numbers of neutrons and protons in the nuclei, so they're, they're really different. So that's why this wasn't expected. <clears throat> and all crystallographers who looked at these examples agreed that this, this is physically impossible because if you replace one atom with a different one, then something should change. So some uh, coordinates should be perturbed at least a little bit. So <clears throat> uh, we did it, we did it quickly, but also over two days on a modest desktop, but also we estimated uh, the traditional tool. So root mean square deviation on finite clusters uh, up to 15 molecules by default as implemented by uh, in Mercury, in Mercury software of the Cambridge Structural Database, we estimated it to require several thousand years on, on the same desktop machine for these 200 billion uh, comparisons. So that's why uh, traditional tools were not uh, realistic. So we, we ran a small scale experiment here to, to get the estimate. And uh, near duplicates, uh, as you have seen, uh, exact duplicates or near duplicates, they appear not only in uh, real databases, as um, uh, we have discussed, but also in simulations. So in simulations, uh, we could produce um, many more crystals, many more, um, and they produced uh, approximations to um, 
local minimum of complicated energy functions. And every of this um, optimization is iterative, so it stops at a certain approximation, often to uh, the same local minimum. And since this, we could come to a local minimum from different directions in a high dimensional space, with approximations uh, very similar, but they could look different in uh, at the level of SIF files. And unfortunately, this actually highlights uh, a big uh, loophole in call crystallography. Because we could take uh, a SIF file, we'll, even with extra um, information such as structure factors, a SIF file of a real crystal, uh, so from, from uh, an experimental database, we could easily change its unit cell. So for example, by applying a linear transformation, we could double or triple that unit cell and then we could perturb slightly atoms in that extended, in that large new unit cell to make it primitive. And, uh, <clears throat> and then if we replace uh, some atoms with different ones, as we have seen in previous examples, then they will be, uh, it will be very hard to understand that a new perturbation, newly perturbed crystal, is actually nearly identical to an already existing one. Because there are many existing ones, and as you see, it's slow to compare them by traditional tools. So it's very easy to disguise uh, a perturbation, uh, very easy as a new material. So hopefully the CCDC will uh, implement our invariants for wider use. Uh, but let's uh, now discuss uh, yeah, something new that happened in uh, well, the last half a year. So November 2023, uh, Nature published two papers, one after another in the same uh, issue. So one was from Google, uh, present, reporting a database of simulated crystals, so not real, but uh, predicted simulations. And uh, the next paper, companion paper, was by Berkeley's uh, Ailo which uh, claimed to have synthesized uh, 43 of uh, these predictions. So chemist uh, Kivik Lim, uh, so real chemist, uh, so here I quote Robert uh, Palgrave and Leslie Schub, they already actually published in early March this year uh, a chemical review, so <clears throat> uh, discussing why none of the claimed materials produced by a lab were actually new. So most of them were uh, really disordered and a small number, I think only three, were, uh, were ordered and correctly identified, but these three uh, materials were discovered in the last three years, so well, recently enough, but unfortunately they were also not new. So feel free to look at this uh, um, rebuttal by real chemists. But uh, we were, of course, uh, thinking about the larger database of uh, Google's GNOME. So GNOME, uh, GNOME paper uh, discussed or made public uh, a smaller number, so not two million they uh, claimed they originally, but still a large number, 384,000 so-called stable crystals. So there is no exact definition of a stable crystal, but roughly speaking, it's uh, well, uh, as stable as possible uh, relative to, uh, to known crystals. So even, for example, diamond is considered not exactly stable, but uh, as metastable with respect to that uh, energy landscape. So the more recent, uh, review also by chemists so Ramsey Shadri <clears throat> from uh, University of California Santa Barbara so they published so it's also published about a month ago the review of what Google's GNOME paper and this is the exact quote from the abstract so they found, found rather little evidence uh, that these compounds are uh, novel credible or, or useful so both, I think, 40,000 of them uh, uh, actually contain radioactive elements, uh, which would not be very useful uh, to synthesize in practice. So we went further. So we, uh, <clears throat> we actually compared the whole uh, GNOME crystals within, with other databases. 
uh, inorganic crystal structure database and materials project database. So this is what we have found in terms of our earth universe distance on PDD invariance by using uh, 100 atomic neighbors. So here you see thresholds, um, thresholds uh, for these distances in terms of angstroms. So um, one angstrom is approximately the smallest interatomic distance and 10 to the power minus five is really small. Even 0 0.03 is rather small, so it will not be visible by eye. So we have found these uh, coincidences. So 30, uh, 38 of gnome crystals appear in the ICSD as near duplicates, but many more thousand if we increase our threshold. So up to 0 0.03, which means that we need to perturb uh, every crystal, every atom on average up to this uh, threshold, we can get this number of crystals in the near duplicates in the ICSD and materials project. So specific examples. So these are three examples. So three crystals, one in GNOME, one in ICSD, one in materials project. Perturbations up to, uh, very small perturbations. All pictures look differently. So these are simply screenshots from these databases. Pictures are different, but geometrically they are nearly identical. And to our surprise, even compositions are very different, no common elements at all. So this looks very strange because when we uh, replace one atom with a different one, we, we expect to see larger perturbations in distances. So not up to with so small thresholds. But even worse, so uh, I think, yeah, I have a few more minutes to talk about uh, even worse coincidences. Uh, uh, since we've got so many, <clears throat> so many near duplicates by invariants, of course, we looked at them more carefully and we realized that uh, some of the files actually identical as, as texts. So C files were simply identical. I mean, even uh, simple by simple, we didn't need even to look at coordinates. So there was one quadruple, so four files, four C files that were identical text, but appearing as different entries in the GNOME database. 43 triples and more than 1,000 pairs, identical. Now, if we uh, forget about chemistry, if we look only at numbers in these files, so unit cell parameters and fraction coordinates, then we find even more, many more duplicates. So these are uh, uh, duplicates found <coughs> looking only at numbers. If you start rounding these numbers, so up to say four decimal places, again, which is still in angstroms. So numbers coincide with four, uh, up to four decimal places, more duplicates. Up to two decimal places, even more duplicates. So many thousands of these reported simulated predicted crystals in the GNOME database are really near duplicates. So this is uh, the largest group of near duplicates. So all digits are absolutely equal in, uh, in this uh, group of nine files. Uh, all chemical compositions are different, so you could guess that some elements were replaced by different ones. The, number, the total number of elements is the same, but where we slightly you see updated here. Uh, and uh, what extra, <clears throat> what extra um, crystal joins the group when we round numbers up to two decimal places? When it also joins and you see the composition is similar. So let me finish actually with, with the crystallization principle on a positive note. Our experiment on the chemistry structural database, which we are now extending to other data sets, mapped any periodic crystal to the set of atomic centers. And what we have checked, what we have found after forgetting these uh, trivial duplicates uh, obtained simply by atomic replacement, but really different crystals mapped to non to non isometric, so also different periodic point sets, modular isometry. <clears throat> So we lose, uh, roughly speaking, we lose no information when we take only atomic centers. Theoretically, there is no obstacle to go back from the set of atomic centers to a crystal. So of course, uh, 
what does it mean? It means what any uh, crystal, already known crystal, but any crystal that will be discovered in the future, all these real crystals should live at different locations, uniquely defined locations in the in the common crystal isometry space, in the space of isometry classes of all periodic points. So all known crystals are already visible in this continuous universe, but all not yet discovered crystals will be also there. So I think uh, since I should finish quickly, let me um, show uh, one one particular projection of this crystal isometry space to two very simple coordinates to the density, which is well known uh, to chemists, and our simplest invariant average minimum distance to the first atomic neighbor. <clears throat> so that's how uh, the Cambridge structural database looks. You might see here some uh, dense clusters which are easily explained. So the map here is a little bit uh, different only because we excluded hydrogens and uh, considered our periodic crystals without hydrogens. That's why the two clusters, big clusters in the previous picture now become only one cluster. But all, all dense spots are easily explained by many near duplicate crystals uh, existing in the Cambridge structural database. I think I have almost finished. So let me <clears throat> let me summarize actually the two sessions from last week and this week. So last week we talked about the isometric classifications of finite point sets. Today, for periodic point sets, and these are two big directions, but not uh, not everything, because the key problem the geometric in geometric data science is to find complete continuous computable and realizable invariants, not only for uh, finite sets, uh, finite point clouds such as molecules or periodic sets such as crystals, but we could consider and, uh, this problem for any data objects, for example, for graphs. Instead of uh, point clouds, we could consider molecular graphs and even uh, replace our isometry or rigid motion by a different equivalence relation. But the same problem, of completeness, continuity, and computability will still make sense for these different objects. So let me stop at that point. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll stop the recording first. <clears throat>